How do you prove you're not a devil worshipper? How do you prove you're not evil? The case is about evidence. I don't see it in this case. It just seems that all rules, laws, regulations change if your name happens to be Mitchell. Tonight, the murder of schoolgirl Jodie Jones and the conviction of her 14-year-old boyfriend, Luke Mitchell. This is not a program about guilt or innocence. This is an examination of the key evidence which brought Luke Mitchell to trial. We look at the police investigation and reveal disturbing testimony about a potential new suspect which could now challenge the safety of Luke Mitchell's conviction. On Monday the 30th of June 2003, 14-year-old Jodie Jones set off from her home in the East Houses area of Dalkeith to meet her boyfriend, Luke Mitchell. Jodie's mother had just lifted her curfew. After texting Luke the good news, she'd set off to meet him just before five that evening. She never returned. Six hours later, Jodie's mutilated and naked body was found by her boyfriend, Luke Mitchell, and other members of her family off a path known locally as Rowan's Dyke. Lothian and Border's hunt for the killer was one of the biggest murder investigations ever conducted by a Scottish force. Over 3,000 people were interviewed. But suspicion fell quickly on just one, Luke Mitchell. He was certainly no angel. He carried knives, sold cannabis to friends, and was interested in Satanism. 18 months later, Luke Mitchell was found guilty of killing Jodie Jones and was sentenced to life. But worries within the legal and forensic world about Luke Mitchell's conviction have never completely gone away, particularly since he was tried and convicted without a shred of physical evidence against him. Surprising given the bloody nature of the attack on Jodie. There were cuts around the eyes. There were cuts to the, to, the, to, the, to the mouth area and extensive cuts, numerous cuts, across from one side to the other, across the midline, to the neck structures, which extended right through the soft tissues of the neck, the windpipe, almost to the back of the neck. Professor Basutl was the pathologist who examined Jodie's body. This girl would have had in her about 5 to 5.5 litres of blood, most of which has left the body before she died. And we're not talking of a few drops, we're talking of litres of blood. Therefore, if there was this intimate contact, one would have expected some of the blood of the deceased to have transferred itself onto a person who was assisting her. What steps would have to have been taken by the, the offender? to prevent this swapping of trace evidence. Wearing gloves, wearing a covering over his clothing or his body, possibly wearing goggles, wearing something over his head, ensuring that there is no direct contact between his clothing and his body and the deceased. Luke Mitchell and the rest of the family search party were taken to different police stations. There, Luke Mitchell had his nails scraped for forensic evidence and his clothes taken for examination. His body was also examined by a police doctor. He had no evidence of fresh cuts or scratches. Yet Professor Basutl testified that Jodie had severe defensive injuries, suggesting she had put up a violent struggle. The police were convinced that with such a brutal and bloody murder, the forensic tests on Luke Mitchell's clothing, his hair and his nails would provide conclusive proof of his guilt. But the tests found nothing. There was no incriminating evidence of Jodie Jones on Luke Mitchell. If the police investigators had said, Professor, how likely is it that the person who killed Jodie had her blood on him. Very likely. How likely is it, Fessa, that there would have been hair, skin, sweat, saliva, 
anything from Jody Jones on our attacker. Not as likely as blood, but quite likely. It doesn't tell us it couldn't have been him, but it makes it surprising and less likely indeed that it was him. When the results from Jody's body came back, there was also no incriminating trace of Luke Mitchell on her. Is this because of the police's handling of the crime scene? When that scene is in the open, you have to think very carefully about the weather, uh, the environment, whether it's in, in town or in the country, and you have to do what you can to protect it. During his time with the police, Roy Ram investigated 18 murders. Quite simply, if there's a fibre on the body that comes from the murderer, a heavy rainstorm can wash it away. Police procedure dictates every step should be taken to protect a crime scene. But despite rain that evening, Jody's body remained uncovered overnight until 8 o'clock the following morning. Now, if it weren't preserved, there is a possibility, indeed, if it were raining as it was, a probability that some evidence may have been lost. Although Professor Basutl says the transfer of evidence from assailant to victim isn't that common, with Jody's body uncovered for so long, we'll never know what evidence, if any, was lost from the scene. Another mistake seems to have been made by police again that same year. The jury heard that of the four people in the search party, only Luke Mitchell's clothing was taken for examination that night. Alice Walker, Jody's grandmother, had touched Jody's body. Trace evidence from Jody's killer could have been transferred onto Alice Walker's clothing. By the time police asked for that clothing a week later, she'd forgotten what she'd been wearing. Under those circumstances where you've got um, three or four people together in a group finding the body in that way, I would very much have been looking to take, take their clothes and preserving them. That should have been that as a matter of routine at the scene. Luke Mitchell's clothes were the only clothes taken that evening. He's the only person who's forensically examined that evening. His nails are scraped, hair samples taken, DNA taken. What does that say to you that was going on in the police's mind that evening? That certainly indicates to me that the investigating officer, the, inve the investigative team, were pretty convinced that they had a prime suspect. By the 3rd of July, Luke had started to emerge from the pack with a greater degree of suspicion than the rest. All he did was make me more suspicious. The lack of forensics meant the police would have to rely on circumstantial evidence. The first plank of this circumstantial case was the destruction of Luke Mitchell's alibi. He claims he was at home cooking dinner between quarter to five and half past five when Jody was murdered. But an eyewitness suggested otherwise. Local resident Andrina Bryson told police that as she passed through East Houses just before 5 p.m., she saw two people at the entrance to the path near to where Jody lived. Mrs. Bryson described a man she saw as being in his early 20s with quite long, messy hair. She couldn't identify the girl she saw as Jody. On the 14th of August, the police showed Andrina Bryson a book of photographs. She picked out the photo of Luke Mitchell as being very similar to the person she'd seen on the path. If that person is readily available to be identified, they should be put in an identification parade. It's much better to see somebody in the flesh, as it were, rather than in a photograph. According to Scottish Home and Health guidelines, where a suspect and a witness are readily available, an identification parade should take place. Luke Mitchell was never offered an identity parade. There was another problem with Andrina Bryson's identification. Whether it's photographs or a lineup, you would expect um, that the suspect shouldn't stand out in any way from the other people in the lineup, and that everybody in the lineup should be a plausible candidate from the description that the witness has given. Andrina Bryson was shown 12 photographs. Only one person had long hair, and only one was taken against a bright white background. They didn't have a, an arrow pointing at Luke Mitchell, but they might as well have had that. If the background is different, and in particular it's a white background for his photograph, then that is where your eye will be drawn. So if Andrina Bryson picks out Luke Mitchell, that's not a surprise then? It doesn't prove that um, 
Luke Mitchell was the person that uh, she saw, um, what it shows is that um, you know, there's only one person in the lineup who fits her description. You want to be sure that you are putting the right person in front of that jury. And if you put forward a photograph which has been picked out in that way, you can't be certain. So I would have been extremely angry and very disappointed. I would want to do it again. The police were sure that when Andrina Bryson saw Luke Mitchell in court, she would pick him out. This is known as dock identification. It's a very, very strongly leading procedure um, to ask you know, whether you can identify anyone in the court today. Despite the inbuilt bias in this process, despite Luke Mitchell being easily identifiable as the suspect standing in the dock flanked by police officers, despite all of this, Andrina Bryson failed in court to identify Luke Mitchell as the man she had seen on the night of the murder. She picks out Luke Mitchell through a procedure which you say is highly suggestive. She then fails to pick him out during the dock identification. Is it reasonable then to conclude that the person she saw that evening was in fact not Luke Mitchell? I think, I think that's the only conclusion you can draw. It, I, it would undermine her previous identification. Um, she's telling the court, that's not the man I saw. But if Andrina Bryson's early identification is not to be believed, and remember, she failed to identify Luke Mitchell in court, then no one can place Luke Mitchell near the scene of the crime. If your client is described as evil, or as a devil worshipper in publicity ahead of the trial. There isn't anything you can do about that at all. How do you prove you're not a devil worshipper? How do you prove you're not evil? Seldom has a defendant in Scotland been as vilified as Luke Mitchell, a child in law before a trial. He quickly found a new girlfriend, according to the tabloids. He was banned from school and named as the prime suspect in a police report, details of which appeared in the Scottish papers. This became the second plank in the prosecution's circumstantial case, that Luke Mitchell was so obviously out of control that he was capable of anything, including murder. Luke Mitchell's school books, upon which he'd scrawled sinister satanic lines, were also focused on. For the first time since the arrest and conviction of her son, Luke Mitchell's mother, Corin, has given a television interview. I got asked to come into school on one occasion and I just couldn't see the problem. And the teacher couldn't understand why I couldn't see the problem. I just couldn't. It was a normal teenage rant. But if Luke Mitchell's mother wasn't bothered, others were. Although not used in the trial, Ian Stevens' opinions on Luke Mitchell were often quoted by the media. The, the kind of stuff he wrote in uh, notebooks at school and so on was certainly a wee bit different from what the average child writes in the back of their books. And I, I think it's only when people look retrospectively at that you can see perhaps this is part of clues of some mechanism going wrong with this guy. It would guy. worry you. It certainly would. When you read on his school books, I've tasted the devil's green blood, flesh of fallen angels, does that give you an insight into the kind of mind that Luke Mitchell had? It would certainly send a chill down the spine. It was argued these scrawls indicated Luke Mitchell had a dangerous fascination with Satanism. But these statements weren't the product of Mitchell's imagination at all. What if I told you that was the script from one of the best-selling PlayStation games that he had been watching in the two weeks before Jodie died? And where actually he could be accused of plagiarism? Yeah, he could be accused of plagiarism, but it's also, it's also again, the difference between somebody who plays that game and gets involved. In it's this difference between reality and a game, which may be a problem there. I would think that's just a typical adolescent meanderings and, and, Baptist, uh, and daydreaming. I don't think that uh, that would cause an alarm to ring in my head about uh, his degree of risk. This is Marilyn Manson. He's one of the most controversial rock stars in the world, and he's critical to the case against Luke Mitchell. That's because the police believed that Mitchell was obsessed with Manson, and they worried in turn about what Manson himself was obsessed with, this. In 1947, aspiring actress Elizabeth Short was butchered and dismembered in Los Angeles. The murder became known as the Black Dahlia case. And these images of Short's mutilated body were painted by Marilyn Manson. Was Mitchell trying to replicate this murder? 
Press reports from the trial suggested Professor Basutal had backed up this theory, but the reality is somewhat different. When you saw Jodie's injuries, mm -hmm. was your first thought that's strikingly similar to the Black Dahlia murders? No. It was my idea. I never heard of the Black Dahlia. There were similarities in terms of big slashing wounds caused by a bladed instrument, sharp instrument, in both the deaths, with Black Dahlia and Judy Jones. That's as far as one can take it. In fact, you would agree there were major dissimilarities as well. There were major dissimilarities. By no means can one say that because the injuries were on in the same sites and caused by the similar way, they therefore must have been produced by somebody with intimate knowledge of the Dahlia murder. No evidence was found on Mitchell's computer that had visited sites featuring images of the Black Dahlia. In fact, there are real questions as to how much Mitchell knew about Marilyn Manson as well. What if I told you that all the police managed to seize from his house was one Marilyn Manson CD which had been bought after the murder mm -hmm. and one torn up calendar. That was it. Yeah, that That's was not an obsession. No, that was surprising. That was certainly surprised me because certainly the impression given was a lot more serious than that. When you say the impression given, would that have been the impression given by the media? Well, the way the media presented it, I would yeah. think. Mm. The press tend to use emotive words. If they, can, if they can use a dramatic word where there's a simple, straightforward word available, they'll always go for the dramatic word. The effect of this media coverage was devastating for Mitchell's defence. People will look back on it and think, oh, that's the Black Dahlia, that's the Scottish Black Dahlia case. Uh, and yet the, the connection with uh, the Black Dahlia case was so tenuous as to perhaps even be non-existent. Salacious gossip surrounded this case from day one. Much of this usually featured Luke Mitchell's mother, Corin, who in the months before the trial became almost as vilified as her son. This sense of outrage reached its peak when mother and son gave an interview to Sky Television on the day of Jodie's funeral, in direct opposition to the wishes of Jodie's family. Did you kill Jodie Jones? No, I never. I wouldn't think of it. I thought, well, you tell them. You tell them how you feel. You tell them that you're innocent, because this might be the only chance you'll get and then, well, it just backfired on us, really. I think most people looking at it found it a rather unusual relationship. It's almost like a gut feeling, based on intuition and experience over the years, you feel, this isn't, this isn't right, this doesn't feel right. And I think I certainly had that feeling while watching that interview with the way that the mother related to Luke and Luke related to the mother. We are close as a mother and son is. A mother and daughter is, and that's it. Their relationship became key to this case. Luke Mitchell claimed he'd been at home cooking dinner when Jodie was killed, an alibi backed up by his mother and his brother Shane. Corin Mitchell had bought a knife for Luke months after the murder. This insensitive act added weight to the police theory that she'd do anything for her son, including burning his bloody clothes in the family's log burner. I haven't burnt any jacket, any item of clothing. The only thing I've burnt in that log burner are logs. In court, however, Luke Mitchell's alibi fell apart. Shane Mitchell admitted he couldn't corroborate his brother's alibi. The prosecution argued he and his mother were lying. Both Corin and Shane Mitchell were charged with attempting to pervert the course of justice. When Luke Mitchell's convicted, their charges were dropped. Would you have helped Luke? I can't answer that question because it's not... I haven't been in that position. But you can't say what you would or would not do if, but if your son had come position. home and said, I've killed my girlfriend, I'm covered in blood, help me. But that didn't happen. But so if it had, would you have helped him? I can't honestly say what I would do because I've, I haven't been hit with that one. You, you, nobody knows what you're going to do in a situation unless you're in that situation, so it's not something you could answer. Some people may find your answer strange because they would think, goodness sake, we're talking about murder here. I would never protect anybody in that situation. Is it different because it's your son? I don't know. You cannot answer that unless you're faced with that situation. Have you ever asked Luke whether he killed Jodie? 
No. Why? I didn't need to ask him. I had, I've never needed to ask him that. That would surprise some people that you didn't ask. It wouldn't surprise a lot of mothers. You know what your child is capable of or not capable of. Is um, Luke capable of killing Jodie in that way? Absolutely not. No. Luke loved Jodie. The ten months of negative publicity leading up to the trial made it easier for the public to begin to believe that Mitchell was capable of killing Jodie. But would that publicity affect the recollection of some of the key witnesses? This was the third and most crucial plank of circumstantial evidence against Mitchell. Luke Mitchell had changed his story about the arrangements to meet Jodie that evening. And the police were even more suspicious that Mitchell appeared to know exactly where Jodie's body was. But in Jodie's sister's initial statement, the notion that Mitchell led the party directly to the body is less clear. Luke's dog started jumping about at the wall. Luke then climbed over the wall and started searching about. In his statement, Janine's boyfriend Stephen Kelly describes the dog pulling Luke to the wall and jumping up, just below a V-shaped break in the wall. Luke Mitchell's recollection is similar, although he says the dog reacted after the V. Suddenly she stopped and starts sniffing at the air next to the wall, just past the V-cut in the wall we can get through. She starts, like, trying to climb up the wall with her paws and sniffing over it. I have to double back slightly to find this V-shape, and I climbed over. I would always look at the, the first statement they gave, and, and I would give that primary um, importance. The person remembering will be least likely to have encountered um, other information that they acquire after the event, which may lead them unconsciously to reinterpret uh, their memory. Janine Jones, Stephen Kelly and Luke Mitchell all gave statements to police over the following weeks, stating it was the dog who's the first to react to something on the other side of the wall. But at the trial, both Janine Jones and Stephen Kelly insist Luke Mitchell walked straight to the V, not past it. This suggested he knew exactly where the body was. In the trial, Janine Jones described Luke Mitchell as being unemotional on finding Jodie's body. But Mitchell's 999 call suggests otherwise. The lad is in a bit of a panic. He's saying, can you come down as fast as possible because he's seen something. I don't know what, as he will not elaborate. I would think it's probably more credible that um, everybody was in hysterics. Uh, that's the original statement of uh, Janine Jones. The evidence of both Janine Jones and Stephen Kelly was heard and challenged in court. The jury believed their testimony. By the time we get to the courtroom, uh, the witness now perhaps has a whole range of new information. And this isn't necessarily a conscious process. Um, it's simply the normal way of remembering, where we use all the information that's available to us to construct an account of what must have happened. By the start of the trial, Mitchell is no longer the 14-year-old boyfriend of Jodie Jones. He's a cold and calculating teenager. Luke Mitchell was the main suspect from day three in this investigation, and the police believed that forensic evidence would confirm their initial suspicions. When this didn't happen, they had to build a case against Luke Mitchell based on circumstance alone. The prosecution believed this circumstantial case to be compelling. The jury agreed with them. Although tonight, Frontline can reveal that, again, the jury wasn't told everything in this case. Scott Forbes is a former student at New Battle Abbey College in Dalkeith, half a mile from where Jodie's body was found. He has a lengthy criminal past. He's also given a statement to police which, if true, suggests other leads weren't followed after the murder. In this statement, Scott Forbes paints a disturbing picture of the actions of one of his roommates on the evening that Jodie was murdered. Now, we can't name the man in question for legal reasons. But if Luke Mitchell's schoolwork was alarming, so was that of Scott Forbes' friend. He told me that um, three weeks before Jodie was murdered, that he gave an essay to the college that, um, about killing a female in the woods. On a few occasions, he's showed me um, graphic images on computers 
like um, somebody being chopped up by a helicopter. Scott Forbes's friend was on a methadone programme whilst at the college. The term ended three days before Jody's murder. Forbes's friend was one of the few to remain in New Battle. Jody Jones was killed on, on the Monday after I left. On the Tuesday, the man in question came to visit me at my house in Leith. He had scratches on his face. And what did he say? He told me he had poked his hair in the eye after spraying after shaving it. And then five minutes later, he told me he fell over a table and then his hands had cut, scratched his own face. And then he, he says he thinks he ran into a bush. Scott Forbes suspected his friend might have killed Jody Jones. He was in New Battle. He had been taking methadone, part of his program. Um, large amounts of Valium, large amounts of speed, and he'd also been drinking and smoking hash. Um, On the evening that Jody, Jody Jones, Jones was, was killed. You were convinced that mm -hmm. he had mm -hmm. killed her. Mm -hmm. Scott Forbes claims he talked his friend into going to the police. He claims he took him to Dalkeith Police Station on July the 3rd, the very date Luke Mitchell was emerging as the prime suspect. Scott Forbes claims his friend was told by police that day that someone would be in touch. What I know now is they, they won't touch him at Christmas this year, December this year, three and a half, three and a half years after it. So December 2006, from what you understand, oh, from what that, this man has told you, mm -hmm. is the first time they've been in touch with him. Luke Mitchell is appealing his conviction. Scott Forbes's statement is now being investigated by Mitchell's defence team and may form part of the appeal. We showed this statement about Scott Forbes's friend to Dr Keith Ashcroft, who specialises in the study of sexual crime. The very fact that it's abusing many different types of drugs um, uh, will possibly indicate that there, there may be more than just a personality disorder, there may be um, elements of a drug-induced psychosis or he may have the baby predisposed to a psychosis such as schizophrenia. If you had known about this person? I would certainly, uh, if I was asked to, to comment, to, to profile, I would certainly put this guy in the loop of the investigation. A man living close to the murder scene with a history of drug abuse and a liking for violent and graphic images. A man who'd written about killing a woman in the woods. Is it possible that such a man turned up at Dalkeith Police Station with fresh scratches on his face three days after the murder of Jodie Jones and was allowed to go? Scott Forbes has a lengthy criminal past. Why should we believe his story now, nearly four years after Jodie's death? Well, if I got to game by telling lies, this is, um, this is the hardest thing I've heard in my life. Why? Um, how are you going to go with me? 14-year-old teenager was butchered. Um, my opinion, police didn't investigate that murder. Lothian and Borders Police declined to participate in this film as the case is subject to an appeal. They did, however, give us this statement. Many of the points raised are defence issues that were heard in court and vigorously debated in the course of the judicial process. The jurors, having listened to the evidence presented by the Crown and heard the defence case, came to the conclusion that Luke Mitchell was guilty of the crime of murder. As with all major cases, we review the work that we do to see what can be learnt for future inquiries. The police did not say if they had spoken to Scott Forbes or his friend. Luke Mitchell may well be guilty. The jury in that high court may well have been right. But the holes in this case, the lack of forensics, the flaws in basic police procedures, the focusing on Luke Mitchell as a suspect to the apparent exclusion of all others, together with the undermining of the evidence which was used to blacken his character, all add up to real worries that his conviction as the killer of Jodie Jones is unsafe. The case is about evidence, solid building blocks of evidence. And for me, I don't see it in this case. And I would be worried that the wrong man was in custody. What if Luke Mitchell wasn't guilty? How have we portrayed a 14-year-old boy through a process where there is no way back for him in terms of uh, public perception, even if his appeal were to succeed? Luke Mitchell will forever be associated with Marilyn Manson, with the Black Dahlia killing, 
and uh, you're in a situation now where, for a whole host of reasons, we're left with an unsatisfactory conviction.